as most of you know, because I think most of you have heard this pitch before, um, I took the surrogate. Um, the backing for all of this comes from my father. Uh, he's an interesting guy, he's a patent attorney. Uh, he's a self-made engineer, the youngest of the family of 11. And because he had to sort of scrounge for education, his father was a Civil War veteran that had been sliced up some at the Battle of Gettysburg. And uh, um, uh, he had a cushy job in Washington, which was that day's version of veterans benefits. Uh, anyhow, um, Dan was a self-made engineer. Uh, he also was very smart about uh, technical companies, the right ones to invest in, you know, like IBM when it started. I remember visiting IBM's first plant, a cold water walk-up on the inside of New York. And as you probably know, IBM stands for International Business Machines. They made mechanical card sorters. Anyhow, uh, he had the greatest respect for education. And um, so the fact that lectures like this uh, are sponsored by funds that you made and left for such a purpose. And I've often said that if it was really his spirit up there looking down, he must be delighted this afternoon. Now, we have someone that is, as Professor Sulak mentioned, my personal hero, because, as Professor Sulak mentioned, he's a clock man. We have a number of clock men here today. For instance, I have Professor Ramsey right in front of me. Uh, who, ran, who did what's called Ramsey Flop. That's the Ramsey transition method, and the clocks wouldn't work without it. Um, I, I'm told that I did uh, uh, had the first machine that used it at MIT. I'm not sure if that's true, but it's close. Um, and we'll hear more about that, I'm sure. Um, the thing is that uh, uh, things were very rudimentary in those days. Uh, I don't want to go into great detail, but uh, I have here a slide that was taken from my thesis of 1956. Um, and uh, that's what a clock looked like in those days. That up there, um, that over there, what? Oh, I got a thing. Oh, that's great. <laughs> they're ready to push on. Yeah, uh, that's the vacuum chamber. Uh, you know, it's 107 inches of cast brass. And if you want about the worst possible thing to make a vacuum system out of, that's it. Uh, quite apart from the fact that brass has a hell of a vapor pressure, uh, it's also porous. And uh, I still remember taking that thing apart and taking it down to a local milk, uh, milk can tin dipping place. And we tin dipped this thing in a vat of uh, sort of leftover solder that at least sealed up the uh, porosity. Uh, we also uh, fixed vacuum uh, leaks with something, I think the official name is Apiezon Q. We all call it Akin Pucky. Um, but anyhow, that's the sort of thing that is the old clock. Now, um, I was, of course, simply a member of J.R. Zacharias's team at MIT. Uh, the team at um, Harvard was headed by Professor Ramsey. Uh, and at some point, uh, they did all the things that they could do at the time uh, with making clocks more precise. There was, of course, the big clock uh, that was uh, Zacharias's inspiration, and as uh, most of you probably know, you've got to slow down uh, the atoms in the cesium beam so you can look at them a long time so that you can get the precision according to the uh, uncertainty principle. Well, uh, Zacharias had the idea that you shoot the beam up in the air and they'll stop by gravity. Well, if you put the details in, uh, you find that you'd have to have an awful tall uh, vacuum system to stop the most common velocity. And the best way to do is to break through the second floor of building 20 and have a vacuum system that was 15 feet high. Um, when you do that, you find that the most probable velocity in the beam, remember this is a beam of atoms, it's neutral. Um, there have been made attempts to focus it with the uh, dipole moment, but uh, that was done on DR Hamilton at Princeton, and it's okay. But, 
Uh, in this case, you're just squirting them up in the air. It's even to this day called a fountain. This is the season fountain. Now, in 15 feet, most of it hits the roof. Uh, I believe it's something like 132nd, the most probable velocity. Remember, we said these are atoms being squirted out of an oven thermally. So it's a thermal velocity distribution. Um, and the most probable velocity just hits the roof. Um, I believe, I'm a little uncertain in memorizing this number, that Zachariah said, OK, we'll take a big beating on this um, uh, in intensity. Because what I need is the 132nd, the most probable velocity. So I made a great big oven. And then the great big oven was creepy for it, which is essentially um, uh, cardboard, uh, uh, except it's made out of nickel. And the point is that uh, it didn't work. Because um, as far as we can tell, according to measurements made by Ray Wise, who is here, um, and who now runs Nico in the world, uh, the slow atoms were knocked out of the beam by the fast atoms. Now, um, the developments that have gone on since then, I believe it's still called the Zacharias Fountain. But there are much better methods of slowing them down than trying to use gravity. And I believe that's what we're going to hear about this afternoon. Uh, Professor Claude Colantanucci is a Nobel laureate. He comes to us from the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris. And he has extended the precision that we were able to accomplish with things like this by something like three orders of magnitude. Uh, he is, of course, a Nobel laureate, having uh, gotten his Nobel Prize along with Jones and Chu in this area. And uh, so, without further ado, <laughs> let me introduce Professor Claude Colantanucci. I'll be the call of our